morning, guys. Glad to see you here today. Uh, go ahead and grab your Bibles. Uh, James chapter 1 is where we're going to be uh, hanging out this morning. Uh, I'm excited to be back with you. I had the last two weeks off. Uh, I enjoyed uh, taking uh, some time and uh, seeking the Lord on some things and resting a bit. So uh, I appreciate that time off. Hopefully you were blessed by uh, Sean and Micah the last couple of weeks. Uh, but I am excited uh, to be back up here uh, with you guys. And I'm very excited uh, to be beginning our study of the book of James today. And so uh, <clears throat> I've been praying as I've been studying and preparing for this series. I, I've been praying that this would be a fruitful time for us as a church, not just as individuals, although yes, I do hope that each one of us individually learn uh, some things about the scriptures. It's always a good and noble pursuit to study the Bible, to learn uh, things like that we should be doing that. And so I pray that we learn some things, uh, but more importantly, I pray that there would be uh, growth in, in each one of us individually. But even beyond that, my prayer has been for us as a corporate body that this would be a fruitful time as we study the book of James. And, and I mentioned this three weeks ago, last time I was up here speaking. I, I said uh, that this uh, season that we're entering in, as we study the book of James, um, ultimately, what I want us to be seeking the Lord about is the answer to two questions. Who are we and what are we doing? Right? As a church, who are we? Why has God called us to be here? Why has God brought us together? Who are we and what are we doing? What has God called us to do and, and how are we going to live that out? Right? And so this is ultimately the, the, the kind of behind the scenes, under the surface, as we study James, I want us to be seeking God uh, as uh, we journey together on these things. And so, uh, very excited about James. We're going to be in this book for 14 weeks. Um, I, I think we're taking a break about uh, a month from now. We'll be taking a week off for Family Sunday. Um, but other than that, I think that's the only break we'll be taking. So from now uh, up until November, we're just going to be in uh, the book of James. I'm very, very excited about this. So uh, let me kick things off this morning uh, by asking this question, and I want you guys to participate. So uh, this is a rhetorical question. If you would answer yes to this question, I want you to raise your hand, and I want you to raise it high and proud, okay? And so let me ask this question. By the show of hands, how many of you are hypocrites? Raise your hand. Wow, see, I, I didn't expect such boldness from you guys. All right, so, so uh, I, I had some follow-up questions, but since you guys are just so honest, I don't know, need, know if I need to even ask them, but, but I'll ask them anyway. They're in my notes. So uh, do, do you find yourself falling short of good intentions? All right, so, so you have good intentions, right? You, you uh, have these good intentions for yourself, but you often find yourself kind of falling short of your own good intentions. Or, or maybe do you know what the right choice is, but you often choose the opposite, right? You know what the right answer is or what the right choice is, but, but you often find yourself doing the opposite. Or, or, or how about this one? Do you project a better image of yourself to others? Facebook. Instagram, right? I mean, we, we are all guilty of this. We project our, our marriage is awesome. Our kids are amazing. We always eat gourmet meals. We always go on awesome trips, right? We project this image of ourselves that we are amazing, and awesome, and glamorous, and beautiful. And, and this is the image we project to the world around us. In reality, it's not true, right? And, and so we are all hypocrites. And, and I'm thrilled to see that you guys are just so self-aware this morning uh, that, that, that you're just willing to answer truthfully. And because the reality is we are all hypocrites. Uh, one of the, and I've said this before, one of the biggest accusations against Christians is that we're hypocrites. Right? So if you were to go out and just go out on the streets and just interview random people and, and ask them what they think about Christianity, what they think about church, I guarantee you're going to run into at least one person that says, oh, I don't, I don't go to church. I don't associate myself with Christians because they're all a bunch of hypocrites, right? They say one thing, but they do a different. They fail to practice what they preach. They're, they're all, they, they project this image of holiness and perfection, but I know what they're really like. 
And, and the best answer to this, and, and this isn't my own response. I, I heard this from someone else, but I love it. And the best answer to this is to say, yes, you're right. You'll fit right in with us, right? <laughs> Yes, we're all hypocrites, so are you. Come join us, right? We're all hypocrites trying to get better, right? And and so this accusation that Christians are hypocrites, I mean, it's a ridiculous accusation because it's human condition. We're all projecting images of ourselves that we're better than what we're not. We all fall short of our own good intentions, right? This is just human condition. We're all hypocrites and ultimately this is what the book of James is trying to address is this issue of hypocrisy that we would live genuine faithful lives that that we wouldn't say one thing and do something different there there wouldn't be a disconnect between what we say and what we think and what we believe and what we do right that we our faith would be genuine and alive. This is ultimately what the book of James is going to be addressing. And so uh, as we study through this book, I want us to just keep that in mind, just that that reality that that we're hypocrites, right? We could just breathe easy this morning, right? Just breathe out. And and the reason I wanted us to confess that right from the beginning is we're not boasting in our hypocrisy, but we're confessing it, right? And we're just breathing out and, and just be set free in the truth that we're all hypocrites. And we don't want to be. Like I said, we're not boasting in it. We, we don't want to be, but we are. And so we're laying that before God and we're saying, God, help us to live genuine, faithful lives. We, we don't want to be hypocrites. We don't want to be known for that. But we want to be known for people who, who when we say one thing, we mean it. And, and what we say and what we confess is how we live. Right? And so this is what the book of James is going to challenge us to do. And so uh, we're going to be kicking things off here. James chapter 1, verse 1 through 12 is the section that we're going to be looking at uh, today. If you have your Bibles open uh, or your Bible app, you can follow along. We'll have it on the screen as well. Uh, by the way, just so you know, the, the translation I usually read from is the ESV. Uh, so that's if you want to follow along with that version. But James chapter 1, what, what I'll do is just read the full section. So we're going to read all 12 verses, and then I'll go back and and try to kind of pick it apart and dissect it and hopefully put it back together in a way that makes sense to you. So that's my goal. No promises. We'll see what happens. So uh, James chapter 1, starting in verse 1, this is what it says. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. All right, so James addresses his letter here in verse 1 with a pretty standard greeting. Again, he says, James. Uh, So from James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion or uh, the 12 tribes scattered abroad, greetings. Uh, Now, we put out a video, I think it was on Friday, about a five-minute video kind of introing the book of James. And so in that video, I I talked about who James was, who he's writing to, why he's writing. And so uh, I I don't want to go over too much of this here. If you did not watch that video, you can find it on uh, line on Facebook. 
Facebook, YouTube, it's all over the place. So uh, go back and watch that video. But, but I'll just say uh, this, just for the sake of time. James is the half-brother of Jesus, which is remarkable to think about, especially here he addresses himself as a servant of Christ. This is his half-brother. He grew up with Jesus. So it's pretty remarkable uh, to think about. And then he's writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion or the 12 tribes scattered abroad. So James is writing to Messianic Jews who are living outside of Israel. And, and ultimately, he's challenging them in this book to live out their faith, right? to let their light shine among the Gentiles. And, and so this is who James is, who he's writing to now look how james begins his letter in verse two he, he's not going to mess around right he's just going to come out swinging so again verse two he says count it all joy my brothers when you meet trials of various kinds now notice what james is not saying here james is not saying to have joy in the midst of trials that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is to count it all joy when you face trials of various kinds. See, that's very different. So James is not saying to just have joy in the midst of trials, but he's actually saying to count the trial itself as joy. In fact, if you look in the, in the Greek, what it's actually saying is to see your trials as a cause or occasion of joy. To see your trials as an opportunity to rejoice, as a source of joy. Now, now that's huge. And, and so some of you are, are sitting here in the, right now, and you're, and you're hearing me, and you're saying, okay, Ryan, that's too tall of an order for me. Because some of you are in the midst of trials even now. And, and by the way, I love how James says various trials, because uh, that leaves it so open-ended. Right, so what kind of trial is he talking about? Various, right? It, anything and everything, you name it. If, if it's a trial, it, it counts here. So whatever kind of trial, whatever kind of difficulty you're facing, you are to see it as an opportunity to rejoice, as a cause or occasion of joy. Not, not just have joy in the midst of it, but see it as an opportunity to rejoice, and so, like I said, some of you are like, well, that's too tall of an order. How, how am I supposed to do that? And, and so I'm glad you asked, because James is actually going to answer that for us. So, so James is going to answer two questions. And so this is kind of my sermon this morning. He's going to answer two questions, why and how. So why should we count it all joy when we face trials of various kinds? Why should we see our trials as an opportunity to rejoice? And then secondly, how? How can we begin to shift our mindset and begin to see our trials as an opportunity to rejoice? So that's the sermon this morning. So uh, let's get after it. So uh, again, James goes on to, to answer this first question, why should we count it all joy? And he says this, verse 2 and 3, to count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, I love this word steadfastness because this word literally means endurance. So think of working out, right? And some of you are going to have to think a little harder than others, but it's okay. So uh, think of working out, right? And so if you've ever worked out, if you've ever uh, been through physical therapy or, or any of that, if you've ever just gone on a walk, um, if you've ever worked out or exercised in any way, you know that exercising can be an excruciating painful, miserable process, right? And so, I mean, your, your heart's beating, you can't breathe, you're sweating, your muscles are aching. It's absolutely miserable. I don't know why anybody does it, right? It's not a pleasant, good time, but what is it doing? It's building endurance, right? It's building strength. And so in the same way that this is what happens with our faith, our, our faith must be tested, it must be challenged. It must be exercised so that we can build endurance for the days ahead. And this is what James is talking about here, that the testing of our faith, when we go through trials of various kinds, the testing of our faith, it's building endurance. 
It's, it's exercising, it's working out, it's challenging our faith, and it's building endurance in the same way that, that exercising our physical bodies do. And, and, and this is why, James, James goes on to say, this is why we should exercise our faith. Because, in verse 4, he says, Let steadfastness, or let endurance, have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, this word perfect is an interesting word. In fact, James uses it seven times in just five chapters. So James is a pretty short book. It's only five chapters long. And in five chapters, he uses this word perfect seven times. So so that's, if a word is repeated, uh, it's it's an important word. And this word perfect is an interesting word. It, It actually means wholeness or completion. So like when we hear the word perfect, we think of like really well behaved Right, organized, right, right? this kind of idea of perfection, that, that we never do anything wrong, that we never make mistakes. But, but this isn't the word perfect that James is using. This word actually means wholeness or completion. And the idea here is that our head, our heart, and our hands would be in perfect sync. That there wouldn't be disconnect between what we think and what we say and what we do but that, that our head, our heart, and our hands would be whole, would be in perfect alignment. In other words, that we wouldn't be hypocrites. So this is the idea. Again, seven times he uses this word, perfect, whole, complete. This is the whole thing that James is after, that we would not be hypocrites, that there would not be a disconnect between what we say and what we do. That there wouldn't be a disconnect between what we believe and what we actually live out, but that rather we would be made perfect and complete. That our head, our heart, and our hands would be brought in perfect alignment. That our faith would be genuine. And so if you've ever met a genuine Christian, like, and you know what I'm talking about, like a, just someone that you're like, that person's the real deal. Right? A, just a genuine Christian. They practice what they preach. Right? They, they, they don't put on this facade. They're the real deal. So if you've ever met someone like that, I guarantee you they've been through some stuff. They've been through some difficult seasons and times that have, that have washed away the hypocrisy. And their faith has become alive and genuine. Why? Because the exercising of your faith builds endurance and makes your faith genuine. Right? Because someone who's been through some stuff, or right? someone who's been through various trials, right? they, just, they don't have time to play games. Right? They're past and beyond all of that. They just don't care. They don't care what you think about them. They don't care. They're beyond playing games or wearing that facade. Their faith is genuine because their faith has been exercised and refined by fire. Right? This is what produces genuine Christianity. And the opposite is true. If you've ever met a shallow Christian, right? someone who's, I mean, they, they, they might have, uh, like on the surface, they appear to be holy and spiritual. They, they kind of put up this front, but when you really get to know them, they're shallow. Right? There's just no genuineness there. There's no authenticity. There's no real character or integrity. If you've ever met someone like that, I guarantee you that they have not really experienced much or if they have been through trials they've not allowed it to exercise their faith they're much like uh, you know the gym is uh the gyms are filled to the brim in january right because everybody's got their new year's resolutions so the, the gyms are packed out in january come february they're empty again right because people get these ideas i'm gonna i'm gonna this year i'm gonna get in shape but then what happens they go to the gym and they realize this is hard Right? My, I, this, is not, this is not worth it. And they quit. And, and the same is true with, with many Christians. We, we, we have this noble idea that we want to follow Jesus. That we want to be genuine Christians. But then when we actually go through trials and God begins to test our faith and try to build endurance and strength, we realize this is hard. This isn't what I signed up for. 
And we often fall by the wayside. And so this is why you'll often see shallow Christians that they might be on fire for a season, but when real difficulties come, they're nowhere to be found because they realize that this this isn't what I signed up for. I don't want to go through difficulties and trials. I don't want my faith to be exercised. But this is what makes our faith genuine. This is what builds endurance. And so ultimately, if, if you want to remove the hypocrisy in your life, because like, like I said, no one, we don't want to be hypocrites. Like we're not sitting in here like, oh, we're all hypocrites. Oh, well, we're just going to live with it. Right? We don't want to be hypocrites. We want, hopefully, I mean, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Right? I, I know that I am. Right? That I don't always practice what I preach, but, but I don't like that about myself. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I want my faith to be made genuine. And if you want your faith to be made genuine, if you want to remove the hypocrisy in your life, the best way for that to happen is you have to go through some stuff. You're going to have to go through trials of various kinds. Your faith is going to have to be tested and exercise so that you can build endurance for the days ahead. And we don't like that, but this is just how it works. It's no different. Again, your physical body, if you want to get in shape, you're going to have to exercise. And it's not going to happen overnight. And it's no different with our faith. You know, Jesus talks about if you want to be, uh, if, you, if you want uh, to be trusted with more, you're going to have to be faithful with what God's given you. And this is even true in the context of suffering and, 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 and stewarding trials. That, that if we expect God to trust us with more, how do we expect that if we can't even trust God in the little that he's given us? Even in terms of trials and sufferings, if we can't even suffer through the small trials, how do we expect our faith to grow and mature and be able to handle more? Our faith has to be exercised, tested, challenged, so that we can build endurance, so that our faith will be made genuine and real. Right, so, so this is the why. Right? This is the why that James gives us, that, that, uh, that we, we are to count it all joy when we face trials of various kinds. So, so if you're going through a trial right now, or, or, or maybe you've been one, you know they say that you're either in a trial, you've come out of a trial, or you're about to go into one. I mean, that's just kind of how life works. And so whatever phase you're in, maybe you're in a trial, or you're about to be in one, or you've just come out of one, and, and, and you are to see that trial as an opportunity to rejoice Why? Because the exercising of our faith builds endurance and makes our faith genuine. Right? This is the why. And that sounds awesome. But the real question is how? Because that's different. You you may know the why, but the how is a whole lot different to live out. Right? So so we know the why, but, but you might be asking, okay, but how do I begin to change my mindset? I know why I should see my trials as an opportunity to rejoice, but how do I begin to shift that mindset and see it that way? Well, James is going to go on to answer that question for us as well. In fact, he's going to answer it uh, with two answers. So the first one is we have to change our perspective, and the second one is we have to change our pursuit. We have to change our perspective, and we have to change our pursuit. And so the first one he gives us here is we have to change our perspective. We, we can begin to count it all joy when we face trials, when we begin to change our perspective. This is what he says again, verse 5 through 8. He goes on to say, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so wisdom, ultimately, is having the proper perspective. Right? And this is the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom, ultimately, is the ability to properly see and apply knowledge. So this is why you've probably uh, seen someone who's really smart, like they're incredibly intelligent, but they're, they're not very wise, right? They, they make terrible choices, 
right? Their, their finances are a mess. Their, their marriage is a mess, right? Everything's fall- They're really intelligent, but everything's falling apart because they don't know how to properly apply that knowledge because they lack wisdom. And, and the opposite's true. You can see someone who, who might be dumb as a brick, but they're incredibly wise, right? And, and, and so knowledge and wisdom are very different, and wisdom ultimately is the ability to properly apply knowledge. It's, it's having the right perspective. Someone who's really wise, they just have the right perspective on life. And so what James is ultimately saying here is that when we go through trials of various kinds, we need wisdom in order to understand what God is up to. We need wisdom. We need the proper perspective in order to understand what God is up to. And what is the proper perspective? Well, James goes on to say that we are to ask God for wisdom who gives generously to all without reproach. And so the proper perspective is knowing that God is good and generous. That God is good and generous even in the midst of trials. And when we have this wisdom, when we have this proper perspective and we know that God is good and generous even in the midst of trials, that this gives us cause to rejoice in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the pain, because we have wisdom. We have the proper perspective to know that whatever's going on, God is good and he is generous and he is faithful. So I can rejoice in the midst of this because God is good. This is, this is why James says we, when we go through trials, we have to ask for wisdom. We need, we need to change our perspective so that we can see who God is and what he's up to, that he's good and generous, even in the midst of trials. Now, now I do want to clarify here, because I think it's important, that there is a difference between happiness and joy. Right, there is a difference between happiness and joy. Ultimately, happiness is, is a fickle emotion that's based upon what is happening around you. And, and it is fickle. I mean, th- this is why you can be in a really good mood one moment and the smallest thing will happen and, and you're in a bad mood. Right? Usually for me, it's slow internet. I mean, that, that's my kryptonite, okay? I'll be honest. Like, I, I could be in a really good mood and Netflix isn't loading and my day's ruined, right? Uh, or, or one day you can just be uh, happy, content with life, and the next day you wake up and for no seeming reason, you're just kind of down, right? Happiness is a fickle emotion because it's based upon the conditions around us. It's based upon the climate. But joy is different because joy, the type of joy that God gives is based upon God's goodness, which never changes. So happiness is a fickle emotion that's based upon our circumstances, which are ever-changing. But joy is based upon God's goodness, which never changes. And so when we are in the midst of storms, when we are in the midst of trials and difficulties, we are to ask for wisdom. In fact, James goes on to say that we are to ask for wisdom. We are to ask for this proper perspective. And we are to ask in faith and not doubt. In other words, what I think James is really getting after here is is that we are to have faith that God is good and not doubt that God is good. In the midst of trials and difficulties, we are to have faith and wisdom to know that God is good and not doubt that God is good. Because when we doubt God's goodness in the midst of the storms, James tells us that we are a double-minded man, unstable in all our ways, and we're tossed to and fro like a wave in the sea. Right? Doubt makes us unstable. But joy, the goodness of God, the wisdom to know that God is good, it anchors us in the midst of the storm. So whatever difficulties you're going through, whatever trial you face, whatever storm you're in the midst of, if you doubt God's goodness, you will be tossed around like a wave in the sea. But if you, if you know that God is good, even in the midst of that, it will anchor you in the midst of the storm. God's goodness is an anchor for us. 
And so when we have this wisdom, this proper perspective, and we don't doubt God's goodness, we can begin to count our trials as an opportunity for joy, as an opportunity to rejoice, as, as a cause, as a source of joy. We have to change our perspective. And then the second thing that James gives us here, not only do we need to change our perspective, but we need to change our pursuit. He goes on to say in verse 9 through 11, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Now, James is going to have quite a lot to say in in his letter about the dangers of trusting and pursuing wealth. Uh, So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here because he's going to have much more to say about it over the next uh, four months as we study through this book. But, But the example that he gives here is that of a wildflower. And so think of a wildflower, right? They, they, they look beautiful, but it's very momentary, right? Its beauty and its splendor is momentary because the sun rises and its heat, it, it, it withers away. It's fleeting and passing. And James says, so is the rich man in the midst of his pursuits. But the language that James uses here is very similar to what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 6. We're not going to turn there and read it, but I encourage you to read it. It's interesting. James is, is almost borrowing the same language that Jesus himself uses in the Sermon on the Mount. I think what James is ultimately getting after here is, is that, that a rich man in his pursuit of wealth is no different than a wildflower. It's fleeting. And, and before too long, it's going to wither away. And, and so if we count it... If we're going to count it all joy in the midst of trials, if we're going to see our trials and our difficulties as an opportunity to rejoice, we need not only to change our perspective, but we have to change our pursuits. In other words, we have to examine our hearts and and find out what is it that our hearts are ultimately pursuing. What is it that our hearts want? And so if we're only pursuing that which makes us happy, If we're we're only pursuing that fickle emotion of happiness and we're only pursuing what makes us happy in the moment, it's not going to sustain us during trials and difficulties. And like James says, we're going to be tossed around like a wave on the sea. But if if we pursue the goodness of God, we will have reason to rejoice in the midst of trials. Because again, God's goodness is an anchor for the soul. We have to change our pursuits. And and like I said, James is going to have a lot to say about this as we move forward. So I won't spend too much time on it here. Jesus talks about in in the Gospels where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. I think what Jesus is saying is that that what you treasure, what you pursue is going to reveal what really is in your heart and what your heart really desires. So we have to examine what what is it that that we really desire in this life? What is it that we're really pursuing? Because if we're only pursuing wealth, if we're only pursuing momentary happiness, it's a fleeting thing and it's not going to sustain us in the midst of trials. But God's goodness will always sustain us. And so the more we change our pursuit for the things of God, rooted in the right perspective of God's goodness and generosity towards us, the more we will be able to rejoice in the midst of trials because we know that our faith is being made genuine. And so as we move forward in the book of James, like I said, what he's really after is is that we would have genuine faith, that we would remove the hypocrisy. And like I said, the best way for that to happen, if you really want your faith to be made genuine, the best way that that's going to happen is for your faith to be tested to be exercised, to build endurance. So this is why we are to count it all joy. We are to see our trials as an opportunity to rejoice because God is good and generous and he's doing an incredible work in us to make us genuine followers of Jesus. 
James closes this section with this encouragement. I'm going to end with these same words. James says again, verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you are good and generous, even in the midst of the trials and difficulties that you're doing a work in us, that you're building endurance, that you're making our faith genuine and strong and good. So I pray this morning for each one of us, especially those who are in the midst of trials and difficulties, I pray that you would bring peace and comfort to their hearts, that you would begin to change their perspective, and that you would begin to change their pursuit so that they can be able to truly see those trials as an opportunity to rejoice. You are good and generous even in the midst of it. And let us never waver from that truth, but let us rest in it all the days of our life. It's in your name we pray. Amen.